Real life history is sadly missing out on some of the cooler parts of Game of Thrones. There once upon a time was a belief in giants, dragons, and magic, but tragically none of that has been proven by modern science. Thankfully, in real life and history, we've never had to deal with frozen ice zombies before. I don't really think that our medieval ancestors would have possibly been able to stop them without dragons or at least without Jon Snow being real. But what real history has had to some extent is the rest of the story behind Game of Thrones. In this video, I'm going to be explaining some of the real life bases and stories that inspired Game of Thrones. That means that certain characters and locations from the books and show may have not only one historical inspiration, but possibly several. Game of Thrones is a unique story in a separate universe that doesn't perfectly reflect our own. Likewise, our own history doesn't perfectly match up with Game of Thrones, but it is incredibly interesting to see the similarities and the differences. I will largely be focusing on medieval Britain for this story, so allow me to set up the story for you. This is Westeros on the left, and the British Isles on the right. They don't really look too similar, but with a little bit of tweaking on the right, we can make them look very similar. Just move Ireland over here under England, flip it upside down, and expand it to look like this. You can definitely see the comparison now, but now, when we flip England sideways, we get a pretty amazing contrast. Keeping in mind that in Westeros, across the Narrow Sea, we have another continent called Essos, and in the real world, we have another continent across the English Channel called Europe, let's analyze how similar the history is in Britain to the history of Westeros. In around 1200 BCE, we have these guys, called the Celts, who started to arrive in Britain. They had some space-age technology that the small tribes of the islands didn't have, called iron weapons, like spears and swords. The Celts gradually settle all of the islands until this guy, called Julius Caesar, invades Britain in 55 BCE. They left with some money, but a guy named Caligula decided he wanted to actually conquer the land, so he assembled an army of 200,000 Romans to do exactly that in 40 CE. But when they got to the beach in Europe, he got bored of that and ordered his soldiers to just collect seashells for him instead. And that's not a joke, by the way. Caligula really was that crazy. Anyway, the Romans actually invaded the land in 43 CE and started to conquer the Celtic tribes. They expanded their border all the way up to here, where they decided to build a wall that would stretch across the whole landmass from sea to sea. The wall was built to keep the savage northern tribes like the Picts and the Caledonians out and low-ranking Roman men who served at the Wall were forbidden to marry and often served for their entire lives there. Men from all over the Empire would come to the Wall to defend the edge of the known world against the Northern Barbarians. Does any of this sound familiar yet? In Westeros, we had the invasions of the First Men, who settled the land and they built a wall across the north to protect themselves from wildling barbarians and from frozen ice zombies. The wall in Westeros is 300 miles long, 700 feet high, and made of ice, while the wall in Britain is only 73 miles long, varies between 10 and 20 feet high at places, and is only made out of stone. In Westeros, these new people called the Andals invaded the land across the sea from Essos and overthrew the First Men, kind of establishing a coexistence between the two. The Andals create dozens if not hundreds of tiny little kingdoms all across Westeros that gradually over time formed into the seven kingdoms that we know of in the story. In real-world Britain, the Roman Empire collapsed, and by 410 CE, the Romans had abandoned the British Isles after more than three centuries of rule. In this atmosphere of chaos came a new invader, however, the Germanic Saxons and Angles who crossed the sea from Europe. The Saxons carved out a huge part of Britain for themselves, and they forced the Celts out. The Celts and native Britons were forced into areas away from the Saxon conquest to places like Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and Cornwall, and some even fled to Brittany, which is where Brittany got its British-sounding name from. The area that the Anglo-Saxons conquered, like Westeros, was divided into small petty kingdoms that eventually coalesced into, wouldn't you know it, seven kingdoms. This is known in England as the Heptarchy period. The seven kingdoms inside England at the time were East Anglia, Essex, Kent, Mercia, Northumbria, Sussex, and Wessex. The seven kingdoms would eventually merge together to form the Kingdom of England, like how the seven kingdoms of Westeros formed together to create the Iron Throne, but we're not there yet. First, we need our healthy dose of Vikings to throw into the mix. Vikings started to make raids into Britain starting in the year 789. They're pretty similar to the Ironborn inside Westeros, so let's stick to this analogy for now. The Vikings raid and pillage all across the British Isles for centuries, and even conquered the city of York, which was the second biggest city in England at the time. In 954, the last Viking king of York, who had the greatest name you've ever heard of, Eric Bloodaxe, was driven out of the city by the Saxons. The Vikings continued to raid all around England and even briefly ruled the entire kingdom for about 20 years, but the last last raid finally came in 1066. This is a really interesting year because three men all decided to claim the English throne. Harold Godwinson was the Anglo-Saxon king of England that year, but another Harold named Harold Hadrada thought that he should be the king too. Other Harold was Norse though, and came with his scary Viking army to enforce his claims on the throne. Homeboy was such a hard ass, his name Hadrada means hard ruler. But Godwinson wasn't no bitch, and defeated him and crushed his army at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Now normally that would be enough to secure victory, but at the same time, William the Bastard arrived from across the channel with his own army ready to conquer England. 
William is most similar to Aegon the Conqueror from A Song of Ice and Fire. Aegon sailed from across the Narrow Sea with his army and three dragons, where he conquered all of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Well, except for Dorne, but even Dorne gets secured by diplomacy later on. Aegon established the Targaryen dynasty in Westeros, who ruled the throne all the way until Robert's rebellion overthrew the last one, the Mad King Aerys II Targaryen. Back in real life, William the Bastard had no dragons, but he certainly did have an army. He landed in England, and Harold Godwinson had just defeated the false king Hadrada in the north, probably after saying something like, You gotta be fucking kidding. Godwinson immediately turned his army around and marched 241 miles south to face William. When he got there, though, William shattered his army, and it's rumored that Harold was killed by William himself and three other knights on the battlefield. William the Bastard was crowned king the same year and became known as William the Conqueror afterwards. After Aegon conquered Westeros, his descendants would rule for nearly 300 years before being overthrown by Robert Baratheon. The descendants of William in England have been shaky at times, but they have mostly ruled the kingdom since 1066. Elizabeth II is technically the 22nd great-granddaughter of William the Conqueror himself, and if the monarchy isn't overthrown Game of Thrones style by 2066, that will mark the 1,000-year anniversary of the Norman Conquest and the near-continuous reign of William's descendants. To say that that entire family history has been full of drama would be a great understatement. It was dominated by drama, the biggest inspiration for the events behind Game of Thrones that we see during the War of Five Kings between Joffrey, Stannis, Renly, Rob, and Balon was the War of the Roses. The War of the Roses is a really, really complicated power struggle that echoes much of the events that we see in a Game of Thrones. In the War of the Roses, several men will claim to be king, many at the same time, and families will fight each other almost to total annihilation. There was a huge cast of extremely colorful characters who had multiple motives, ambitions, and unknown loyalties. This video is already getting pretty long though unfortunately, and the War of the Roses will be a video on its own that will be even longer than this one. Now that the stage is set in the real world, it must be filled with actors, characters, and most importantly, a plot. I hope that you'll subscribe, like this video, and share it, and stay tuned for the War of the Roses next, the real-life Game of Thrones.